So once again, welcome back to MARTA 2024. It says 2023 on the slide, already the first mistake on the slide. Um, but welcome everyone. Uh, we got a little smoother start today. People are still coming in from the waiting room, uh, but I wanted to acknowledge, we rushed past acknowledgements a little bit yesterday. Members of the council that you see on the right part of the slide again, um, who've been so instrumental in keeping MARTA going with monthly meetings, Kate, Peter Voorhees, uh, Kate Brinson, Peter Voorhees, Laura Bartolo, Ben Blazik, Eileen Daguerre, Olga Wodo, Ian Foster, Sega Kalanin, uh, Boris Kaczynski, Aperva Mehta, and Ali Strachan. And of course, uh, Selena Fitzgerald, who has helped make these meetings go, and our three great co-chairs, Deborah Audis from NIST, Coriosis from Johns Hopkins University, and Fatih Sen. Uh, so a couple of things. We have a full schedule today. It's really an exciting schedule um, it's on the, the agenda, of course, is on the website, but we're going to start with session three, which will be on AI-ready data. Start that in a second. We have another poster session, and we've pinned the links for the poster session and for the shared docs for session three in the Q&A. We'll also keep posting them in the chat. The chat is disabled for regular use, but the organizers can use it to put messages out, and we know that people joining the meeting late need to have that chat refreshed, so we'll post those periodically. Um, We'll go right from our panel discussion then on AI Ready Data to the poster session and come back after that for working group reports chaired by Laura Bartolo. Um, we have uh, five working groups that are gonna report out today. That's exciting. And then uh, we have a Google Sheet for that where questions um, can be put to moderate. Um, we then have a presentation from Beth Blaley from uh, Indiana University and also has rebooted the Research Data Alliance US, RDA US. So that's exciting for us to talk about how we can interact with them a little bit and some issues Beth's been working on about repository trust and sustainability. And then we're going to have some breakouts, just Zoom breakouts, um, and we'll have links for those um, and we'll theme those. And if you look at the agenda online, you'll see now that those themes are going to be uh, metadata, repositories, workforce education training type work, and AI ready data. So you can factor yourselves in anywhere that you'd like to have a little open mic, more of a discussion type option on things that we can look into for future working groups or gaps that we can identify that need to be dealt with before we come back and summarize for the day. So that's the plan for the day. We are recording again, so I like to let people know that, the disclaimer that the meeting's being recorded and by participating in the public discussion, discussion parts, you agree to have your participation recorded and posted perhaps on the web later. Uh, and if you don't wanna do that, please just use the Google Docs or the Q&A feature. So without any further ado, then I'm gonna turn it over to Kamal Chahadre from NIST, um, who is co-chairing the first session with Fatih Sen from Novellus Aluminum, uh, who was one of the meeting's co-chairs. So take it away, guys. Thank you, David. Welcome, everyone, to this very exciting event. Uh, my name is Kamal Chaudhary. I'm a staff scientist at NIST. And uh, with me, uh, the, uh, I would like to thank Fatih and all the other wonderful organizers, uh, organizers to make this event possible. So as David mentioned, uh, coming 30 minutes or so, we will uh, have four speakers which will, who will present for five approximately five minutes on their um, <clears throat> topic of, on the topic of AI ready data and we have Tang Fei Liu, Anubhav Jain, uh, Maria Chan and Muhammad Shuabi. So um, before I introduce the speakers I would like Fatih to speak and introduce himself if he wants to. Fatih go ahead. Yeah thanks Kamal and thanks everyone for uh, joining. Um, I think uh, I'm I'm a lead scientist at Novelis. Uh, uh, I work on like computational alloy design here mostly, uh, and um, I'm excited to hear about the uh, the panel discussion on uh, AI ready data. Let's Excellent. Go ahead. Excellent. So yeah, um, let's get started. So right now, the first speaker I see is Tang Fei Lu. So I would like to give a brief uh, by of the speaker. So Dr. Tang Fei Lu is the Dorini family professor in the Department of Aerospace and Mechanical Engineering with a concurrent appointment in the Department of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering at the University of Notre Dame. Before joining UND, he was a postdoctoral associate at MIT. Uh, after obtain, obtaining his PhD from Michigan State University, Dr. Lu's research focuses on exploring the chemistry confirmation property relationships 
of polymers using molecular simulations machine learning experiment. He's an ASME fellow, JSPS Invitational Fellow, DuPont Young Professor Awardee, DARPA Young Faculty uh, Awardee, and Air Force uh, Summer Faculty, Faculty Fellow. So with that introduction, uh, Professor, thank you. Please take it away. All right, thank you very much for the uh, kind introduction. Uh, it's my great pleasure to kick off this uh, panel session. Uh, I would like to take five minutes to talk about the, the data for polymer uh, informatics. Um, so, sorry, uh, polymer informatics, it's uh, like a subdomain in uh, the more broader uh, materials informatics field. Um, however, compared to some other materials informatics uh, areas, um, it's actually in great lack of data. Um, Put a similar uh, field uh, side by side in comparison to polymer uh, data sets. For example, this uh, small molecule data set people have been using for drug screening, for chemistry. Uh, there are many uh, huge data sets out there. Uh, one example is the zinc data set. Uh, I see people use uh, quite frequently. Um, it, it has gathered a lot of citation. Um, well, on the other side, for polymer informatics, the largest uh, data set is uh, PolyInfo. Okay, so this uh, data set is owned by a uh, Japanese uh, Materials Research Institute. Um, it's unfortunately a closed uh, data set. You cannot mass download uh, these data. Um, they even actually prohibit you mass crawl the data, uh, even is by hand. So uh, it has um, received limited uh, attention if you compare the citation of their paper to the zinc paper. I think these numbers are a little bit outdated. Zinc must have um, uh, the citation has uh, uh, increased more dramatically. Um, so that's the situation. Uh, by the way, uh, more description about this data set. It's all experimental. Um, the Japanese government put a lot of uh, uh, money and effort uh, to have people go into the literature and find the data. Um, and then they curate the data and then put it into this database. Okay, it, To some extent, it's understandable. They don't want it to be fully open. Uh, you can inquiry uh, one by one uh, for um, different polymers, but you cannot mass download. Uh, the other uh, polymer, um, it's it's not a data set. It's an outfacing uh, machine learning uh, tool, which is polymer uh, Gino from Georgia Tech. I don't know why it's uh, keep uh, um, scrolling. So uh, this is, again, uh, you cannot mass download the data. And then uh, my understanding is that the data is relatively limited, um, not as high uh, as uh, the poly info. But even for poly info, it's like 17,000. It's nothing near uh, the small data uh, sets, OK? So if you look at the polymer data set, um, there are experimental data set. There's computational. Uh, and later on, I will talk about some hypothetical data sets. Uh, for experimental, um, the community has been treating it as uh, ground truth because it's experiment. Um, however, over the years, what we found is uh, these data are very noisy. Okay, I will, um, uh, are very noisy. Some of the, the same material, uh, different literature have different measurements. Uh, they were actually all put in the uh, PolyInfo uh, database. And if you are able to, say, do a query, you will find for certain properties, the, the, it can have order magnitude changes uh, in terms of uh, the label values. So they are of a relatively small volume, and they do have large variations. For the computational data set, um, it can be more consistent because uh, for example, we use molecular dynamic simulation to generate data. Uh, we use the same protocol, okay, exactly same simulation uh, condition. So the systematic um, um, uh, variation, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's reduced, uh, at least in terms of its generation method. 
Uh, and it can be faster, uh, lead to faster data uh, accumulation because you can run these simulations uh, pretty autonomously, uh, just submit it onto a cluster and it will keep generating data. Okay, It is self-consistent, as I said. Uh, however, because it's computation, you have limited size effect, and then you have the force field if you use molecular simulations, uh, there will be inaccuracy, okay? Um, compared to like uh, the, 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 the best experiments, I would say. And the last, uh, there is a hypothetical data set. Uh, it's usually for the sample space. Uh, for example, here you have uh, for polymer, uh, polyinfo, you have 17,000 data uh, polymer samples. But if you want more, uh, you can say generate more using different techniques. So this is a list of uh, the databases uh, we were able to find uh, when we were studying uh, gas permeability uh, of um, uh, polymer membranes. So this is another slide showing uh, where how we can uh, generate the computational database. Um, so basically you can use a standardized uh, molecular dynamics simulation tool uh, and then you can generate. However, in many cases, uh, you end up, um, uh, the, the simulation can have uh, a variation as well uh, among different groups, okay? Uh, depending on what force field they are using. And also the end target, for example, uh, we wanted to calculate the permeability of gases. It's very difficult to calculate and sometimes we have to resort to indirect data. For example, in this case, the fraction-free volume is a, it's a good um, like um, uh, indirect data that is related to the property of interest at the end. And this computation can lead to more accurate predictions. And then later on, you can use model-centric uh, uh, method like uh, transfer learning uh, to say transfer what you have uh, from these uh, indirect data to the target uh, uh, property of interest. So lastly, uh, I would say in order to increase the size of uh, the sample, people have been using different methods. For example, we used a recurrent neural network and, uh, and there are other heuristic methods trying to combine different uh, functional groups and then generate polymers. Now, uh, on this domain, there are a lot of uh, data sets and they can be large uh, that are open and you can download directly. So my summary is uh, polymer data, it's relatively small compared to other fields. And um, most of them, especially on the uh, label domain, uh, they are not ready for, uh, they're not completely ready for uh, machine learning. Yeah, that's my talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Teng Fei. Um, we'll reserve the questions for the discussion session because of the time. So uh, we'd like to go to the next speaker. Um, in the list, we see Anwar Jan. Are you here, Anwar? Maybe uh, we're still in the process of joining the meeting. So we'll go ahead and <clears throat> start with Maria Chan. So uh, Maria, are you here? Yes. Okay, let's see. So, okay. So, so Maria Chan is a scientist at the Center of Nanoscale Materials at the Argonne National Lab. Her work is uh, at the intersection of AI ML data, theoretical modeling, and experimental characterization data. She has served as a co-chair of MARDA meeting in 2022 and the MARDA microscopy metadata working group. So Maria, welcome. Uh, please feel free to take it away. All right, thanks. Um, I was a little bit confused about the order of presentation. Um, are you seeing the presentation screen? Yes, we can see the okay. presentation screen. Great. Um, so um, you see the first word in my title is towards. Um, so we're working towards AI ready. Uh, experimental characterization data. Um, it might seem a bit strange. Uh, my background, uh, like most of the speakers on this panel, is in computational uh, material science, but um, you know, we will see why um, we've sort of moved more towards working with uh, characterization data and the integration of them. Um, so our reach is quite broad, uh, both in terms of electron microscopy, scanning probe microscopy, and x-ray characterization, and um, other AI computational type techniques. 
Um, but um, the key is that uh, we need nanoscale characterization data because nanoscale structures drive properties. Um, like uh, Tang Fei talked about polymer structures uh, in, in, in the case of the materials of interest for us, um, we are looking at nanoscales so interfaces, grain boundaries, uh, nanoparticles, nanowires, and so on. Um, they are key to the properties of interest um, for energy and other applications. Um, determining structure is non-trivial. Um, for years, people have done energetic minimization um, using either density functional theory or um, um, force fields. However, in um, nanoscale, because of the loss in symmetry, um, there are sort of uh, enormous amounts of structures that are very similar in energy and the realistic realized structures under uh, synthesis conditions are not necessarily the, the global minimum in energy. So we have to look towards uh, characterization uh, of um, many different kinds, X-ray electron microscope being the most prominent, um, but there's actually a huge amount of um, data coming from different types of characterization, coming from the simplest spectros spectroscopic data, like one dimensional or uh, image data that we use to um, microscopy data that are 2D, but then all the way to three, four, 5D data um, that range from you know, kilobytes to, to terabytes in size. Um, all of that is being developed, is being used, all this data, it's, it's coming um, and, and it's there. And um, yesterday, uh, I think it was uh, Dr. Brown who talked about how um, um, people bring hard drives, terabyte size hard drives to Beamline to, to get their data. So this is sort of where we are at. Um, all this data is there. It gives us information about atomic structures that are key uh, to properties, um, but it's not easy to get that out, um, to that, that structure out. So our group has done a, a bit of work on um, the many steps involved in determining the structures um, from these characterization data. So one of the first steps is that we have to be able to do an accurate and realistic forward simulation of this data if we have the underlying structure. So the forward step is key. You know, Without it, we will never know if we have the right answer. Um, we've also worked on uh, matching uh, 1D data, 2D data, and so on. How do we know if our simulation is actually accurate? So we've done some matching on that. Um, a, a large part of the work in this field has to do with pre-trained models. Um, so for example, uh, we have a, um, a spectroscopy type data, call level spectra data, such as X-ray absorption. Um, and we want to determine uh, something like um, oxidation state on bond length in a battery material from these spectroscopic data. Um, so what we have to do is to do a lot of DFT um, and spectral simulations to generate a lot of data. Of course, we have to check that the uh, simulation forward modeling is accurate. Um, and then we work on the AIML part, uh, featureization, di dimensional line reduction, model selection, um, and then we use that to perform inference. Um, so this is sort of a mode of operation that that's becoming quite common, not just for spectroscopy, but also for microscopy and other data types, um, where we have um, uh, basically uh, uh, artificial data generated, simulated data. And and Tang Fei mentioned the very accurate point that you know when you have simulation, you have loss in fidelity. Um, so, so there's all kinds of data like that that are simulated for specific systems um, and used for model training. Um, in some cases, you, you cannot exhaust the possibility. So um, maybe pre-trained model is never going to really work. Um, so we have these um, generative inversion, which are uh, which rely on generating new types of um, uh, structures and determining matches at each step. Um, so the simulation on the right shows how you can match um, or determine a structure for a, a grain boundary um, by uh, generating a lot of possible structures. And you can use it, we use conventional means like uh, Monte Carlo based on hopping or uh, with uh, graph neural network based generative models um, and then determining the matches to that. Um, in some cases, you also uh, can do it for spectroscopy even though the information content is much less uh, in spectroscopy. Um, so from all of this work, we realize that there's an urgent need uh, for characterization data infrastructure. Um, all of this data is, is generated at some facilities um, and, and or individual labs. Um, 
So what we really need is sort of a systematic way um, to track samples, um, to uh, capture metadata. Um, this is very important, as you will hear about the microscopy metadata working group under MARA. Um, and having a metadata schema that allows us to standardize, you know, what, what information should comes with the microscopy image. So it's not just um, what is the characterization data and where to store it and what format. It's it's all all about the uh, metadata. What is what is this uh, spectrum about? You know, what is the sample? What is being measured and why and so on. So a lot of these uh, metadata um, it's key. But then of course there's also the data format and um, access. You know, how to get this data to people who want them. Um, and then all of that, you know, all of these steps will come before being able to analyze or use AIML on, on, on this um, data types. Um, so this is the towards part. Uh, we don't have a funded project on, on all of it, uh, but we, even though we have um, submitted proposals on it, um, but we have, you know, work, we are working on some of the steps uh, where we are uh, working on the, the microscopy data in particular. Um, and getting a, a way for AI um, to be able to help people use the microscopy data. Um, but you cannot have a database that's empty. You cannot build an empty database and expect people to use it. Um, so one of the, the steps that we have taken is to um, sort of precede a database using uh, literature data. So yesterday we heard a lot about um, LLM and um, there was some mention on uh, the plot data and so on. Um, so we have also, um, uh, taken steps towards uh, gathering microscopy and spectroscopy data in particular from literature and use um, previously uh, natural language processing, but more recently LLMs um, to explain and describe uh, the data, the, the microscopy data, spectroscopy data that we get. Um, so this is paper, um, it's, it's just recently published um, on this code called Explain. Um, that extracts the, the um, microscopy data and label them um, so that we can use them for AI. Um, and there's many steps involved, and um, I can talk more about that in the discussion. But once we do that, we can do a lot of interesting things like uh, multimodal uh, embeddings, image and text, and then look for data uh, in, in literature that have you know related contents like absorption, optical absorption. Um, we um, this is the the work that we've done um, um, on digitizing spectra that come from um, separation of um, literature data, um, and you know that allows us to build um, a broader uh, spectroscopy, experimental spectroscopy database. Um, of course, there's a lot of issues with standardization and uh, metadata that comes with that, that it's not completely solved. Um, using this type of um, literature data and multimodal training, um, we can then um, get information that will help us in the autonomous synthesis um, uh, approach. Um, so a lot of this, um, this is a very brief overview. A lot of this work is in this uh, GitHub called Materialize um, to play on the word, you know, eyes, material eyes, but also materialize and make things happen. Um, with that, I will close here. Um, this is a summary. We need um, characterization data for understanding nanostructures, which are key to properties. That's, so that's the central message. Characterization data is difficult. Um, it's complicated. There's so many different types. Um, so we're working from many different angles um, to get the data both simulated and experimental in particular um, to a, a, a way that people can use them. Um, so this work is primarily funded by uh, DOE and uh, we are a user facility. So if anyone's interested in any of those capabilities, I'm happy to collaborate. Um, with that, I will uh, turn this back to Kamal and Fatih. Excellent presentation, wonderful tools and methods. Thank you, Maria, for this presentation. Um, so our next speaker is going to be uh, Muhammad Suyabi. <clears throat> Muhammad Suyabi is a research engineer at uh, Fundamental AI Research Fair at Meta, working on deep learning applications for chemistry. As a part of Open Catalyst project, he helps uh, develop data, data sets, models, and framework to help address societal energy and environmental challenges, particularly climate challenge, change. His current focus is on Electrocatalyst discovery for applications like CO2 reduction and oxygen evolution for renewable energy storage. He spends a lot of time building new data sets and running large scale inference campaigns that make the most of our AI advancements. 
more recently, he co uh, collaborates with experimental partners to help make AI discoveries a uh, reality in the lab. So, Muhammad, uh, welcome to this uh, uh, symposium. And personally, I'm a big fan of your work. So, please take it away. Thanks, Kamal. Thanks for the introduction and thanks for having me. You guys see my slides fine? Yes, yep. yes, we can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. I'll, I'll just go ahead and dive right in. Um, so, just a, as I am a research engineer at the Fair Chemistry here at Meta. Just for general context, for those who aren't familiar what fair chemistry is. So this is different from the fair principles we think about for data. Fair here, uh, Meta has a research group called Fundamental AI Research. And you can like, it's really kind of blue sky research. Um, we think of it as Bell Labs, where researchers are free to explore problems that they think are interesting. Um, one big thing about being at fair is we're really committed to open and reproducible research. So you probably see a lot of the um, kind of generative AI work being done by other colleagues, um, but we're also apply those principles to the work we're doing within chemistry and kind of the data sets we're creating. Um, so more concretely, what the FAIR chemistry team is, is focused on is catalysis, direct air capture, and more recently, uh, display materials for AR and VR. Um, so FAIR chemistry actually originated as the Open Catalyst project. For those familiar, this was several years ago. Um, this is still ongoing, but the big but the big focus here is how can we leverage AI to model and discover new catalysts to kind of address the energy challenges of today. Um, and I'll, I'll highlight some of that work and some of the data sets we've been um, expanding to achieve this goal. And lastly, we're very fortunate to be at a place like Meadow where we have access to large scale compute. And as part of that um, kind of part of that blessing is that how can we leverage those tools to generate data and train models that the community may be lacking? And how do we kind of enable the community to make progress in, in, this, in this trajectory um, by using the resources we have? So with that said, one of the very early challenges we noticed within the community is there, there did lack a large, a substantial amount of data for catalysis. Um, and what we were really thinking about here is how do we build a uh, a generalizable model. So w very common in the literature, we see someone studying a very specific research application, say copper, for instance, um, they may have a small data set, you may build a model for that small data set. Um, and then that model generalizes fairly reasonable within, within that space of copper. Now, the issue is, if I were interested in a different chemistry or a different application, it's an iterative process of, okay, I need new training data, I need to train a small model, and then I can apply it. Um, we really wanted to address this challenge in that, how do we have one very large diverse data set that we can train one large generalizable model that can apply to different domains within uh, catalysis, um, such that this single model will work on your copper system, your silver system, whatever chemistry you're interested in, um, and that's really what we set out to do with the Open Catalyst 20 data set. Um, we kind of extended that work further on with the Open Catalyst 2022 data set. And this one was more specifically focused on oxide materials. Um, OC20 was deliberately excluded oxides. We kind of expanded that effort. And more recently, um, we, we expanded into kind of applications to direct air capture. So this is kind of MOF materials. Um, both of these previous data sets lack that. And that's something we kind of tackled to generate a, a diverse data set to tackle moth materials. And across all these domains, what we're really trying to do is kind of build a DFT surrogate. So a ML force field that given a structure can we predict the energy and forces. And with those properties, people are free to run whatever simulation they're interested in, whether it be a, re a geometry optimization or an MD simulation. Um, but, the, but, but the big thing here is how can we build that surrogate? And across m all of these data sets, we're looking at order hundreds of millions of training data points um, for, for the community to leverage. And what we've seen is there has been incredible progress over the years. So um, very early on back in 2021, some of the earlier models, DimeNet, um, were a lot poor, were not as accurate as we have made, we have we've currently reached. So we can see that there's been over a 50% reduction in kind of performance accuracy for both energy and force predictions. I won't dive into the details of the modelings, but I think just the, the main point here is 
the creation of these data sets not only enabled our group to kind of develop new models, but it did give a platform for the community to use this data and build more accurate models that the community can also leverage. Now, one thing I did want to highlight that that is something new to us is while the computational data is great, building DFT surrogates is great, um, we've seen incredible progress that how these ML models are becoming practically relevant to predicting um, computational properties. But the big question that we're gonna constantly face is, okay, your ML model is fancy, it's, it's performing within DFT accuracy, but is it actually accelerating the discovery process? Um, and that's something we've started to look into in partnership with the University of Toronto and some other collaborators in that, how can we say, start with a large chemical space and use ML and maybe a combination of DFT to accelerate this pipeline of synthesis characterization um, and essentially making an experimental database. There's lots of challenges associated with synth synthesis and characterization. I'm not gonna highlight any of that right now. What I really wanted to focus on is this bridge between the experimental databases and the ML models and the ML tools we have. And not surprisingly, there is a huge lack of experimental data um, and, and specifically, you have several research papers that will have different synthesis techniques, different characterization techniques. And if someone were to kind of gather all that data and train an ML model, it's not really straightforward because there are inconsistencies, um, things may not be reproducible, and it's not really apples to apples when you're trying to train an ML model to predict experimental properties. One other thing we've noticed is they are entirely biased towards positive results. Um, I mean, not surprisingly, people push out papers of their exciting findings and less so about like the negative results. So while all these labs and research groups have these negative results on hand, it's not kind of publicly accessible for people interested in kind of bridging this bigger picture ML to experimental um, prediction. Um, and a, another challenge is how do we kind of leverage data from different synthesis modalities? So if I asked one lab to synthesize me a copper 100 surface versus another lab, um, their synthesis techniques may be entirely different. Um, the actual thing they synthesize and ultimately characterize may not be identical. So how do we actually combine these different data points into an ML model is kind of a big open question for the community. And lastly, how do we centralize the, co the computational data? So a lot of us do computational work, but even within the context of say training a DFT surrogate. Um, some people may have different DF levels of DFT theory, theory, there may be different settings. Um, and a lot of this data often exists in just some GitHub data dump. And it's not really obvious for a, say a researcher wanting to tr train these ML models of how to combine these data sets. So thinking about how we can centralize all these efforts to make it really easy to kind of train these future ML models is really a big challenge moving forward. And I'll leave it at that and we can probably pass back to Kamal. Thank you, Muhammad, for the excellent presentation. And I feel like the challenges you talked about, we can have a workshop on each of the point itself. <laughs> so maybe we can have bring up these questions during the panel discussion. So I just saw Anubha Jan uh, join. So Anubha, um, are you here? Can you try to share your screen? Meanwhile, I'll try to so Anubha Hello, Jan, okay. hey Anubha, yes, I can hear you. So feel free to bring up your slide and I'll try to give a small introduction. Uh, so Anubha Jain is a staff scientist, chemist, uh, focusing on new materials discovery using high throughput computations at LBL, Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Anubha works in new material discovery and design using a mix of theory, computation, and data mining. He serves as the associate director and as a third leader for the materials project a multi-institution effort to accelerate material discovery by computing the properties of all uh, known in inorganic properties. And who also serves as a part of the central leadership team, as well as a data core objective lead of the Durable Materials Duramat Consortium, where he works on analyzing a wide array of solar phot uh, photovoltaic data sets. Uh, other research interests include, uh, include using natural language processing, to extract data from the scientific literature, new catalyst for oxygen, uh, oxyanion, oxyanion removal from water, new mechanism for 
uh, thermal energy storage, thermal electric materials, and machine learning representation of crystal structure and band structure. Really awesome to have you here, Anwar. Uh, thank you for accepting our invitation. Please take it away. Thanks, Kamal, for the introduction. And um, yeah, really happy to be here. Uh, I have just a couple of slides to you know see the discussion uh, for later. This first slide is uh, an analysis I did where I tried to look at all the papers that do machine learning research in material science. So I, I use the Scopus database to find about 7,000 papers that are on the topic of material science machine learning. And then I tried to see what are the papers that these 7,000 papers actually cite in order to do their research. And the idea here was to try and find out machine learning research goals studies, how are databases being used in downstream studies. And I think this field of uh, machine learning in material science is pretty unique because you can actually build very naturally off of uh, previous studies. You can use other people's software, you can use other people's data, and then you can build upon that for your own research. So looking at the results from this study, I looked at, I, I kind of compiled on the slide, uh, all the all the types of techniques and papers that have been cited more than a hundred times within this group of 7,000 papers. And what I found is, uh, first of all, some interesting things. Uh, Scikit-learn is the most cited software amongst all of the, the research. So even though Scikit-learn is considered more, let's say classical machine learning, and you know today there's a lot of buzz about deep learning and all of these, you know, large language models and everything. The most commonly used thing now, even in 2023, if you do this by year, is still scikit-learn. And I think this points to the fact that there is a lot of small data sets still in machine learning, and the ability to apply deep learning type techniques is still not fully developed. So uh, the more classical te techniques that scikit-learn implements are still interesting. Um, the other things that you see are that a lot of the other software that's cited are things that are related to uh, you know, crystal structure, and molecular machine learning. So VASP is, of course, a density functional theory software. And this points to the fact that a lot of research is based on fitting machine learning models and density functional results. And all these other ones like PyMatGen, PhonoP, MapMiner, Aflow, and Obito, these are all related to uh, software for uh, looking at simulation type results. So there certainly is a need for experimental based software, I would say, as well. Uh, and, and, and these are not popping up uh, at the top of the list. Uh, we see similar things for databases as well. If you look at what sorts of databases have been cited very frequently with materials research, three are all uh, simulation databases of density functional theory data. And of course, there are other databases that exist for experimental data. Again, they're not quite as highly cited as of today. When you look at the machine learning methods, uh, we see kind of similar things to scikit-learn, where even though, again, we have a lot of the fancy deep learning methods uh, available to us today, uh, the papers that are currently published still are using random forest and gradient boosting and these sorts of techniques uh, much more frequently. Uh, finally, if you look at the sorts of material science methods that have been cited in these papers, uh, again, we see you know, GGA DFT, uh, molecular dynamics, and things like that. But now we're also starting to see descriptors for uh, crystal structures and uh, neural network potentials pop up as well. So, you know, I think a lot of this points to the fact there has been quite a lot of work in uh, simulation based machine learning, but there still is a lot of room to uh, do great work in the experimental area as well. Just to kind of visualize the progression a little bit more clearly, um, this is the performance on one of the benchmarks that we run called MatBench. And what these are, are is one of the MatBench uh, benchmarks, which is prediction, predicting the formation energy of materials uh, using a data set of about 100,000 compounds for a materials project. And uh, we, we have lots of different algorithms that we tested for them to develop, continuing to test those algorithms. And uh, what you see here in this plot is the progression of the algorithms we had back in 2017 or so, which was like random forest with magpie descriptors. And then we see this huge drop in performance or this huge gain in performance when we switch to this crystal graph neural network technique. And then subsequently after the, the development of the crystal graph neural network, there have been steady improvements to that technique and additional uh, uh, improvements 
adjustments made over time that have really brought this down to very, very low errors. So about 17 MeV per atom of formation energy, which is you know about the level of accuracy that we probably expect these DFT calculations to have in the first place. Uh, so certainly in certain parts of uh, materials machine learning, there has been quite a lot of progress. In terms of challenges for the future, uh, here are some maybe general areas where there could be challenges. Uh, data size and complexity is certainly one of them. Um, we find that many of these algorithms do very, very well once you have large data sizes and you know there's like a power law scaling uh, with the, the, the data set size as a, with the performance of the algorithm. Um, but getting large data set sizes can be very expensive, both from a simulation standpoint as well as an experimental standpoint. And now we're seeing you know industry be involved and generate data sets that maybe we can't make in academia uh, and then not necessarily having full access to those data sets. So that is something that we should uh, talk about for sure. Uh, then there's the issue of extrapolation. Uh, I just showed that MatBench data set and I showed that we had really good performance by 2024. But there have been several studies that show that if you trade on, let's say, materials project database from 2018, and then you try to test it on materials project database from 2021, all the new compounds that came in, it actually doesn't do nearly as well. Uh, or if you try to do not a random train test split, but you try to do a train test split in a way that tests extrapolation better, that the performance is not as good. So being having better ways to test extrapolation is also uh, needed. Uh, we can also talk about interpretation and how these machine learning techniques can, might, might help us uh, actually get physical insight into what's going on rather than just giving us predictions. Um, access. So as I mentioned, you know, more and more companies are getting involved and these machine, these data sets are getting bigger, the machine learning bigger with many, many more brand. But then the issue of access to both trading the models as well as having the app coming uh, an issue. And then finally, relevance, how can we make sure that the data sets that we produce and the machine learning models that we produce are actually relevant to solving the, the machine learning, sorry, the material science problems that we're trying to um, hit. So with that, let me uh, end and uh, look forward to the discussion and hopefully we can talk about some of those topics.